Hello, thank you very much for having me here. It's a delight to be here. I was fascinated when Andrew started um, the, uh, in, when, when the invitation came saying that he, the title of the uh, session here was called Sparks of Brilliance, because Sparks of Brilliance is what Artichoke trades in. We're not artists, we're producers, but we love to work with artists and create for them a platform that allows them to share their most extraordinary ideas with the broadest possible public. We believe that nobody can be brilliant all the time, and that the spark of brilliance, the ephemeral moment, the extraordinary instant that changes your life forever, is one of those things that can be injected into the life of a city in the most extraordinary and surprising ways. So Artichoke was founded eight years ago to create a platform for artists to change the world. And our belief is that the temporary transformation of a public space leaves forever a lasting legacy with the people who either witness or participate in that work and changes their relationship both to the landscape in which they live and with each other. So I'm known in my office as the most analog person in the world. That's why I have this and not a computer. But apparently all I have to do is press a button and you'll begin to see some of the things that we've been involved with. I didn't even press it, that's so funny. They obviously, <laughs> like my office, they d obviously don't trust me. This is a show in, with which we closed uh, central London for four days, and allegedly a million people turned out on the streets to see it. Um, this is one of the large scale in public interventions that we've done over the last eight years. It was a story told by the French theatrical alchemists, Royal Deluxe, in which a giant time-traveling elephant came to play in the streets of London. Um, and the Sultan, who you see aboard the elephant in this uh, picture here, was captivated by tales of a little girl who was traveling the world in a time capsule. And uh, he brought his own time-traveling machine, the Sultan's elephant, with his entourage of concubines and eunuchs, to uh, explore London and to meet up with this charming creature who delighted the people of the city. You have to imagine five years before this event started, the conversations that we were having with the authorities in London. <laughs> I would sit in a room with 25 men, many of them in uniform, and say, it's a kind of fairy story with a little girl and a big elephant and we need to shut the whole of the city and <laughs> the metro needs to be closed down and the uh, buses will have to be rerouted and of course no cars and yes we're going to have to suspend the parking meters and by the way it's so big that we have to dig up all the central reservations and remake uh, recamber the slope of the road so it doesn't fall over etc etc <laughs> and they would say why would we do this? And I would say, because everybody will love it. But there was no evidence. There was no proof. There was no way of explaining what the joy, delight, thrill, charm was going to feel like in a city that uh, is a huge world city. This is the road between the palace and Trafalgar Square on the last day. There was no way of explaining in advance how fantastic this was going to be. And what we developed with those authorities was a sense of mutual trust and understanding in which, after five years of conversation, the why would we do this turned into a why wouldn't we do this. That sense that a city isn't just for toil, trade and traffic, but that it exists for people, for human beings, to enjoy and marvel at extraordinary things. The thing that's being marveled at here that you can see is a project in which we pretended that we discovered a long lost tunnel that existed between London and your uh, fair city of Brooklyn. And with this giant telectroscope, a big telescope that you can see nestling by the mayor's office, and one in Brooklyn, you could stand in America and look at London, and you could stand in London and look at America. And as you can see, children explained their lives to each other through this device that was pretending to be something from a Victorian era, but actually using an extraordinary kind of technology. It was tempting to say to people, do you know what? You could do this in your bedroom. 
It's called Skype. <laughs> but, but in my campaign against the digital, um, or the digital only as a tool, that wasn't the point. The point was the adventure, the machines, the extraordinary nature of a communal event in which live people met together on both sides of the Atlantic and did something completely bizarre. This next piece you're looking at is a piece by the French company La Machine, in which a giant spider, for some reason not clear to anybody, suddenly appeared hanging on the outside of a building in the city center. You can see in the ceremonial heart of the country. <laughs> and you can see the result. What you see is this extraordinary impact, which is not about anything measurable. I mean, of course, we measure the economic impact of what we do. I could tell you that the thing in London uh, cost a million and a half pounds and generated 28 million pounds for the local economy. So many people came to see it. But that isn't really the point. The point is the brilliance of these artists in reimagining our world and allowing us to see a place that we're very familiar with, a landscape that we walk through perhaps every day in a totally new and different way. And the legacy that that leaves, the extraordinary change it makes, is that those people in that picture who are being drenched by that water cannon are laughing. And they're laughing with each other and together in, in our cities, which are often places of division. Often when you hear about people coming together in large groups in cities, it's for reasons of conflict. But with this uh, liberation of the artistic imagination, you can, I think, transform those places into shared spaces where the car doesn't predominate and where the human and the emotional is the currency that is most on, in evidence. So what actually happens with our work? This happens, hundreds of thousands of people coming together at any one time. But what really happens, which is also as interesting as this effect, I think, is the impact that the work has on the attitudes of those who rule and govern our cities. That change between why would we do this and why wouldn't we do this? That sense that the rules that we have ourselves invented to keep our cities moving, to keep our cities efficient, to keep us all getting to work on time and getting away from work on time, those are not somebody else's rules. They're our rules. And if we choose, we can change them, briefly or forever, depending on how things work out. The piece that you're seeing at the moment is a piece by the, art, the British artist Anthony Gormley in which he asked us to produce an idea which was to inhabit what's called the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. There are, if any of you have been to London, there's Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square and three plinths with great big statues on them. And I would defy anybody in this room to name those statues. Anyone been to London? Anyone know what they are? Anthony's idea was to give the fourth plinth, which is empty, to members of the British public to inhabit for one hour each. And the show lasted for 2,400 hours without a break. Each person was videoed non-stop. And the point was to change the idea that this space, the ceremonial space, was a place where we memorialize our dead British heroes and to transform it for a brief period, brief to everyone else, very long for us, of 100 days, three and a half months without an interval, um, into a place where the human, the living human, was celebrated and was celebrating whatever they felt they wanted to use it for. <laughs> the negotiations that we had to go through with the public authorities over this was extraordinary. It's a grade one. <laughs> Some of them were funny. Some of them were incredibly moving. Some of them made you cry. I could tell you stories about the ones that made you cry. But day, night, non-stop, we just played with that space and turned it into something else, a different kind of story. And finally, this is a project that we do every couple of years in a very small northern city called Durham in the north of England where there is some magnificent architecture. There's about 40,000 people who live there. And we use the imagination of artists to change things, 
This is Durham Castle. It's actually owned by the university, who were frightened about having a very large inflatable star on the top of their building. As you might be, they were frightened that the ballast, which was water, might leak through the uh, roof and destroy the rooms underneath. They were frightened that it might blow away. They were frightened that it might look stupid. There are many reasons why people are frightened. And one of my jobs is to identify those anxieties and take them away. And what we found is that if we can explain to people a different kind of world, a world in which their anxieties, their sense that they're being asked to take responsibility for something that might go wrong, the what if mentality. If we can say not, please may we do this, but actually say, we're doing this, how can you help us? That those anxieties disappear and that they join us in an extraordinary journey that allows them, whether they're the oh, I don't know, the health and safety officer, the risk manager, the transport official. They join us on this journey that says, this city doesn't always have to be like this. Because actually, people will like this. People will not be afraid. People will not criticize. Let me say, we have our fair share of critics. Mostly taxi drivers who find that suddenly it takes three hours to get from Hyde Park to Piccadilly Circus. And obviously there are people who think that this is a piece of frivolity that cities could do without. But the majority of people who both experience it and buy into the thing recognize that these life-changing moments, the joy that you see on the faces of these audiences, that's not a frivolous thing. We're tempted in the 21st century to think that we should trade only in the hard facts, in the things that we can measure and calculate, in the ways in which the metrics of an event are the only things that matter. It's a bit like when you go to a gallery and you're wandering through the gallery and you begin to find that you're actually only reading the labels. You're not actually looking at the work on the wall. And for me, when people ask me to supply the economic impact statistics or the numbers of jobs created or the, uh, the number of hotel beds that were used in the area during our event and the percentage increase between that and the norm, obviously we do all those things because in order to justify the very large amounts of public cash that go into these events, um, we have to obey those rules. But it isn't really the point. The point is the transformation of the human being and their shared joy and anticipation in being presented with a world that they could never have imagined and can only briefly experience. Going back to the thing I showed you at the beginning, the elephant and the little girl, that really did change Arts Council policy. The Arts Council is the body in England that funds the arts. Before that, work outdoors was considered to be sort of frivolous and a bit scruffy. You can see from any of these images that nothing of this is scruffy. And after the elephant happened, we got thousands of messages and emails and uh, telephone calls from people saying how much they'd liked it. And one in particular stays in my mind. It was from a man who wrote and said, um, today I feel the most extraordinary mixture of joy and grief. Joy that I met them and grief that I will never see them again. Thank you for teaching me that cynicism is not a way of life. Yours, 40-year-old television executive. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was quite a triumph, and it's one of the things that I treasure most. So this brings me back to this uh, lovely festival, Lumiere, that we're about to do in both Durham and in the divided city of Derry, Londonderry, in Northern Ireland. Derry, as the name suggests, is a place where, for years, any of you who are familiar with the Northern Irish uh, situation will know that there has been conflict between two communities in Northern Ireland for a very long time. And we are moving into the public spaces of that city with an invitation to the citizens and visitors to explore together after dark territory with which they may not be familiar. 
some of those community members live behind walls because they fear or are feared by others. We're working across the town. We're working with 120 kids from eight different schools. Education is still segregated in Northern Ireland. You go either to a Catholic school or a Protestant school. There is one that is mixed. We're using the festival as an opportunity to bind together people who perhaps have no real opportunities to meet each other in the streets, even now in the UK in the 21st century. We're using the imagination of artists to create worlds that we hope will be fascinating to everybody there, whether they're resident, whether they're visiting, whether they are the people who are in authority in that city. And we've had to ask them to do the most extraordinary things. We've had to ask them to shut roads, move pedestrian crossings, rebuild buildings. Famously in Durham, uh, where we piloted this festival, I once had to ring somebody in the council and say, Davy, I'm really sorry, but I just need to knock a wall down. He was the head of transport. And he said, in this order, OK, where is it? That was because that was the second time we'd been in that town. And we had by then established such a bond of trust with him and with that authority that they understood that we wouldn't be asking unless we knew, that, unless we needed to, that we wouldn't be asking unless we were going to rebuild it, that we wouldn't be asking if it was one of Durham's 10th century listed medieval walls. And his ability to say yes and then ask the question about where was for me a demonstration of the journey that he and that council had gone on, which identified areas of anxiety and risk, and then in a way lived with them. Because really, walls come and go, holes in the road are dug and filled in again. Stuff happens in our cities all the time, but usually never with the excuse of an artistic, unmeasurable, extraordinary emotional experience as the excuse for it. How many times do we see cables laid in a road or a water main that needs to be fixed? We don't even think that the road needs to be closed in order to fix it. But in our work at Artichoke, we're fixing something different from the physical infrastructure of the world in which we live. We're fixing the fact that our communities are increasingly stuck behind screens of telephones or televisions or computers <coughs> need these moments where they can come together, where they can share together, and they can all understand and marvel at the extraordinary world in which we live and the extraordinary imaginations of those people who are able, on our behalf, to transform it into something completely different. Thank you. <laughs>